Little boxes on the hillside, little boxes made of ticky-tacky, little boxes, little boxes, little boxes, all the same. There's a green one, and a pink one, and a blue one, and a yellow one, and they're all made out of ticky-tacky, and they all look just the same. And the people in the houses all went to the university And they all got put in boxes, little boxes, all the same Something what is known as the box model, all right? And we're going to take our little boxes and we're going to format them in a way so that they don't look all the same, all right? Come on, you got to give me credit for trying on this one. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to think outside the box. Actually, we're going to think, well, I don't know. We're going to think inside the box. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, I have a colleague that, that teaches econ here that plays songs periodically that matches uh, something. And sometimes the, sometimes the connection is, uh, you know, you have to think about it for a second. Uh, oh, what, what was the one song she played for monetary policy? And it, it was by Johnny Cash, and I thought that's why she played it, because Johnny Cash for monetary policy. As it turns out, there was another reason for it. I, I don't remember what it was. It was more obscure than that, but it's like, that's about all I remember from Econ, is it has something to do with cash, so, you know. All right, we're going to take a real quick diversion to talk about pseudoclasses, because you can have a lot of fun with pseudoclasses. Pseudoclasses allow you to accomplish things such as having a different appearance for your links when you hover over them. So they're a lot of fun, all right? So let's look at this old example that we had. And what we can do with the pseudo class is we can go in and we can say, we can style the link and we can say a link it's just a link in its normal state. Maybe has a color of yellow and a background of blue. All right. And so now if we look at this, there it is. And we don't see it. Why don't we see it? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. But for now, let's switch and let's make the color blue and the background yellow. So the pseudo class is this little thing after the colon. And the pseudo class of link, colon link, means the link's just sitting there. Nothing special about it. All right, so there we go. Now, with the pseudo class of hover, I can do something different if I put my mouse over it. So, if I do a link hover, I could do something like, make the color white and the background black. And, well, we'll have more fun in a second. If I put my mouse over it, I get the little hover effect. Real nifty, simple way to do it. Now, you can go crazy with this, right? And if you do things like change the borders of it or change uh, the background color and the borders, you can actually kind of get a button effect going on here, all right? You could, for example, I'm going to keep it at blue, but I'm going to give it a border of one pixel red solid when I hover over it.
so it kind of gives it a buttony effect. Or you can put the border on it and then take the border away when you hover over it. Or you can change the border from a 3D inset to a 3D outset and almost give us sort of a, an effect for uh, of pressing a button. Or, all right, you can do things like swap the background image if you really want to go go crazy with it. Um, but you, there's an awful lot of flexibility even without using background images. As a general rule, I, I kind of avoid using background images for links just because that's a little bit of extra overhead. It's not a huge deal, but you know, old, some old habits die hard. All right. The point is, is this is another way that you can signify to people in a very obvious manner that this is your link. All right. You can even do things like make the font bigger. Two M means twice as twice the emphasis, so twice as big as it would normally be. That's obviously an extreme case just to make it visible, but it's a nice demonstration of what you can do with this. Again, this like any other fact effect should be used judiciously. You don't want to go crazy and you don't want to uh, you know uh, do it just because we know how to do it and it seems to be fun. All right. Now, the one thing that we can do too is if we might not want all our links to go that way, maybe we only want our links in the navigation section to go that way, in which case we just change our selector. Remember, there's a couple things that you can, you can always do uh, with CSS. You have a selector and then you have the rules. Now, our selector can be based on the tags, can be based on the class, or it can be based on the ID. So if some links I want this effect on and other links I don't, I group all the links together because there's, I'm sure there's some reason why I want some to look one way. Maybe they constitute the main navigation or whatever. I could assign them all a class. Or I could say something like, have a nav section. Go in and put a nav section in real quick. I could say that all my links in the nav section get this effect. This one gets the effect, this one doesn't, because this one is in the nav section, this one isn't. So it's a more involved selector, where I say, not just that I want all my links to behave that way, but all the links in the nav section. And that's probably something that's pretty typical, right? Because you might have links throughout your page that you don't necessarily want to do anything crazy with, right? You just want them to be links, standard, maybe blue background, or a blue text, uh, underlined is good enough, but you might have your navigation net again. You really want to sort of stand out. You really want to make it very obvious and clear that that is your main navigation. Well, some of these effects can do that. Um, there's actually two more, I think. There's at least two more pseudo classes. I can only think of two more. One is active and one is hover, or we, we've already covered hover. The other is visited. So we can make a link look differently if they visited the page which is sometimes valuable, right? Because if someone is searching for something on your site, it oftentimes helps them to, to realize, hey, I've already tried that. So I can go and say, a visited, and then give some look to it.
screen if they've already visited it. Possible, I suppose. Oh, uh. There we go. Show the color of green because it's this. Might be a little hard to see, but that. I've also seen things where you, you can use like uh, a text decoration of a strike through if they visited it. Gee, how would we do that? It is text decoration and, oh Lord help us, don't ever use blank. Line, all right, line through might be a better one for us to do. And that does not seem to be Anyhow, I've seen that done on some pages. And when else might you use a line through style? About when you might use a line through style to put a line through something. Possibly. And the information is no longer relevant, but it was relevant at some point. For example, let's say I'm doing a policy and procedure for for at LC, all right? And the policy says that um, every instructor shall have a uh, instructor lounge that contains a pool on table and an Xbox. And let's say that for whatever reason we decide to switch from an Xbox to a PS3, all right? We could do a strike through through the Xbox to indicate that's how it used to be just so people can think back and say, oh yeah, that's right, you know. Well, why is there an Xbox? Oh yeah, it used to be that. So a lot of times with like policies or procedures, you put a strike through in there so people can like kind of see, oh, that's how it used to be, but it's no longer relevant, all right? Um, sometimes I've seen like corrections for news stories have a strike through, like if they reported that, you know, um, something, they put a strike through. That way, like if you're coming back to it and you think, well, wait a minute, it said something else before. You don't think you're going crazy, right? If they just go and delete it. I've also seen people do that uh, on blog entries just to be cute, you know. Boy, I was really enraged. Then they'll have a strike through and say, happy to attend the meeting today, you know. And then that, they're being cute that way. All right. Anyhow, the bigger lesson here is pseudo-classes. They discuss in the book all of them for links. You need to put them in a certain order so they work right. That could be my issue here. Um, but, uh, again, you can use them to give little effects. And, again, you don't use it just for the heck of it. You use it to give people visual cues. All right, on to the box model. What I'm going to talk about boxes primarily relates to block elements. There's some relevance with inline, and you can make inline act like block and all that, but for now our focus is going to be on block elements. That is divs, paragraphs, 
articles, headers, and so on. And to start off, we're going to focus on the big block elements, such as article, and, and div, and header, and so, and, and so on. Some of these things we've played with already, but we're going to formalize them and, and talk about them in more detail. All right? A block looks like this. We can think of a block as being this. And here's the content. Oh, thank you. Here's the content of the block. Maybe it's a block of text. There are actually three special regions to this block. And they are the padding, the border, and the margin. The margin is the space between blocks. So down here we might have another margin. The margin does not get the background color that I set for this. So if I set the background color, a certain color, is from here on in. The margin does not get this box's background color. It gets whatever other background color was associated with it. The border, then, again, is optional. Actually, in reality, all these are optional. You could have these set to nothing, and, and there would be none, and, and things would be squashed together. But the border is physically drawn, and it can be any color and any number of styles and, and really any size. Padding is the space between the border and where the content begins. All right, let's go and let's play around with this example so this starts to make a little more sense. And I'm going to go and I'm going to make a second article here. just so that we have two articles going on. Let's view this web page, and I'm going to take out all of the styling. I'm getting rid of all the style associated with it. other than these little fixes that we put in, these little hacks. But in Chrome, there's not going to be any style associated with this. All right? There's our first article. There's our second article. One thing to keep in mind as we're doing this, and, and this, is, this is a true statement, um, universally, as we've talked about CSS, is that the way the page looks is a combination of two things. It's a combination of our style plus browser defaults. All right? So there's stuff we control, and if we don't specify something, the browser's going to default it to something. All right? So I'm going to start out, and I'm just going to put an, a style rule for article to give it a background color of yellow. So if I go and view this, notice a couple things with this. 
first of all, there's a little bit of space between them. Why is that? Well, the browser implemented a little default margin. There's a margin by default. So you know I didn't put that space in there, that space is there. And that's something that is really confusing sometimes when you start out. Because you can look and you say, I didn't do that. But again, you do have to remember that the browser default is to put in some kind of margin. Now I can get rid of that margin. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to say margin on articles. Zero pixels. Now when I look at it, on that. Give it a bigger margin. So it's a margin of 100 pixels. All right, there we go. Notice that margin's in all four directions. All right. Notice also that some things might be physically impossible. For example, if I were to give a margin of a thousand pixels, um, it could not, or, or let's say 500 pixels, let's, let's do something crazy. There may be 500 pixels this way, but there is not 500 pixels that way, right? Because there, there's just not that much space on the screen. So the browser sometimes has to make accommodations for what it is you're trying to do. All right, let's go to a more realistic example the brow of having a 100 margin. Now, one thing you'll notice is that if there's a 100 margin on each of these articles, you might think, the space between them is going to be 200 pixels. That's not the case. That is what's called margin collapse. And if you think about it, it makes sense. All right? That's why if we look at this, the margin between these two is not any different than the margin from the left. All right? You might expect this to be twice as big because there's the top margin of the one and the bottom margin of the other. Margins don't add up essentially. All right, let's go back here because I think I might have been showing that screen. Um, the margin, in other words, between the two, I put a margin of 100 pixels. The margin between these two will be 100 even though both have a margin of 100. It doesn't add up the two margins. That's called margin collapsing. And the idea is this. If I have an article with a 100 pixel margin, I don't get, pardon me, I don't get another 100 margin for the top of this one. When I say I want a 100 pixel margin, I'm saying I want 100 pixels between it and the next element. So, if this is a situation, if this one has 100, then this article does have the proper margin. They both have a proper margin, the margin that they're supposed to have. One is supposed to have a, one is supposed to be there's supposed to be a hundred pixels from the bottom of one to the start of the next. Is that true? Yes. The other one, there's supposed to be a hundred pixels from the top of it to the bottom of the previous. Is that true? Yes. So in that regard, by margin collapsing, it's still giving you the margin you want. In other words, it's going to give me the higher of the two margins if I have two things stacked on top of each other and one has a top margin and one has a bottom margin. So if I were to go and change this to 150 pixels, and I were to create a 
class for the second article and give it a margin of 50 pixels. Then the margin, the, the margin between the two is going to be 150 pixels. All right, 150 pixels from there to there. All right, not 200 and not 50. By giving us a margin of 150 pixels, is satisfied everyone's requirements. You know, you can almost think it as you know how they talk about how like people don't like to have don't like people that stand too close to them, right? If you had two people like that and one person doesn't like anyone standing closer than six feet to them, and if another person doesn't like someone closer than ten feet standing next to them, if they stand ten feet away, both of them will be happy. They don't need to stand sixteen feet away from each other, all right? And if they only stood six feet uh, from each other, one of them is going to be anxious. All right, but if they stood 10 feet away from each other, both of them will be happy. Both their requirements will be filled. All right. That's an analogy that, as a very neurotic person, works for me. I don't know if it works for you or not. All right. But that's sort of the idea of it. When you specify the margin, you say, hey, I want to be at least this far away from my neighbor box. All right. So that's the margin. All right, I'm going to get rid of that class because I'm done with it for now. We might put it back later. Now, if I put a border on it, the border won't get the background color. And the border... Um, will not include the margin. Oh, no, let me rephrase that. The margin didn't get the background color. If I put a border on it, the border will not be around the margin. The border will be inside the margin. So if I give a five pixel Then notice again, the border is not like out here around it. So the margin isn't inside the border. The border is inside the margin, if that makes sense. Now you may notice that this content butts right up against the border. And generally that's not too good, right? You generally want a little bit of a gap there. And that gap is called padding. Now, padding gets the background color, all right? And uh, padding, then, is the space, is, is inside the border. So you have the margin. Inside the margin is the border. Inside the border is the padding. And then inside of that is the content area. So if I say padding three pixels, There's three pixels. Let's make it more dramatic. Into a padding of 30 pixels. All right. There, there's 30 pixels padding along there. So that's nice and readable, and we're good to go. Notice as the screen gets bigger and smaller. Right. That's a little bit of a problem, but we'll talk about how we can address that in, in a bit. I'm not sure if we'll do it today or not, but we'll talk about that. 
Why does it do that? It does that because we did not specify a width. All right, so if we don't specify the width, it takes up, because it's a block element, it takes up as much as it can. All right? If we omitted any of this stuff, any of the margins and peng and all that, it would go from side to side. All right? But we can assign a width to it. All right? And I can give the width in terms of either an absolute number of pixels, or I can give the width in terms of a percentage of the available space. The simpler way is to give pixels. Now, we're going to go over examples, and the first few examples that we give are going to be very fixed. And that isn't necessarily the best way to do things, but it's the simplest way to do things. So as we're learning, fixed is a nice starting off point. All right? We'll get into more fluid designs after we, we, we've gone over some fixed examples. But I can specify a width of, let's say, 400 pixels. And there it is. Now notice we don't get that little wiggly thing going on. Right? Another thing we can do, by the way, I guess I will talk about that image issue now, is I can specify a minimum width. I specify a, myth, a, a width, but not a minimum width. What that means is it won't get any smaller than that. So it'll be that big, but as I collapse the screen, it doesn't get any smaller than 400 pixels. So that's a neat thing to do if, for example, you don't want to cut off um, content. You don't want to cut off an image or whatever. For now, though, we're just going to stick with a width of 400 pixels. What if we give a height to it, too? Well, we got a little bit of a problem, right? Because we specified a height of 200 pixels. Browsers don't like to lose content for you. So, It'll do something goofy, like overlay content for you, as opposed to doing something that would cut off content. So in this case, I specified a height of only 200 pixels, and those things are clearly bigger than 200 pixels, so they spill out of there. Now, what can you do all right, to prevent that? There's a few things that you can do to prevent that. One thing that you can do is don't specify a height. Let the browser do the calculation and let the browser figure out how much space it needs. One issue that sometimes folks experience when they learn this stuff is they really try to micromanage everything about it. You know, give it a width, give it a height, give it all these things. The browser is a great piece of software. Browsers are great pieces of software that are very adaptable and Again, they have some default behaviors, and those default behaviors can really benefit you. For example, one of the default behaviors is that if, you know, make the, make the box as big as it needs to be to fit it. So I specified a width, and I let the height go automatically. All right? Generally speaking, that's typically what you do if you're, going, if you're interested in controlling everything. You want to control the horizontal scrolling, so you set your widths in a certain manner. And if they have to scroll vertically, that's less of an issue than scrolling horizontally. There's other things that we can do, though. There's actually an overflow attribute in CSS. And I can set that to... Visible was the default. In other words, I could have it do what it did and have it just scroll outside of the box. I could make it hidden, which probably isn't a good idea, right? Because that's cutting content off. Or I can choose to scroll. So I could go and do this and say height 400 pixels over 
low crawl. And it makes it that big, and I can scroll the rest of it. Auto does something similar. I think it's a matter of whether it shows the scroll bar by default or not. Yeah. Auto only shows the one scroll bar, only shows the scroll bar where it's needed. And in this case, only the vertical scroll bar is needed, so that's all it shows. If I do hidden, it would actually cut off the content. Probably not going to do hidden. You're probably going to do auto in most cases, or maybe scroll. Now, again, is this a good idea from a design perspective to do this? You know what? That's the perfect thing. You see, you, you said I gave you a hard time about an answer you threw out a few classes ago. Just to show that I'm completely fair, that's the perfect answer. Maybe. All right? Remember, the answer to almost any question that starts out from a design perspective, is it good to is almost always going to be maybe. All right? You could probably think of a few exceptions, but most of the time it's going to be maybe. Why? Because it's completely situational. All right? <clears throat> when might something like this be a good idea? A list? Okay. A list of what? Let's scroll down see a whole list. All right, possibly. Here's what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of like a news story, right? How much of the average news story do I usually read? The first paragraph, right? If something catches, in fact, journalists are taught the upside down pyramid. You start out with the most important stuff and then you funnel down until the less and less important details, you know? Um, assuming they still teach journalism. I mean, that's what they taught when I, <laughs> when I uh, had a class in it. So therefore, if I was doing a page of news stories, it might be okay to do the scrolling because the idea is, is that I could put more news stories on the page, you can see the most important stuff, and if you're interested you'll scroll, but if not, you can just skip through it. Now if there was something where I would expect people to read or want to read most of the page the whole time, then scrolling's a pain, and I wouldn't want to do that. All right. The point is, is, you know, we could sit and we could debate and we could come up with advantages and disadvantages. My point is, is at least consider these issues when you're doing it. Consider does that, you know, add to what it is I'm trying to do? Or does that detract from it and make it harder for people? You know? If at least you have the sensitivity to think of that, and especially if you have the sensitivity to think about it from your persona's perspectives, in other words, the typical people that you think are going to be visiting your site, then I'm guessing you'll do a pretty good job. Might not nail everything absolutely correct, but that sensitivity is probably the most important thing, as opposed to applying personal preferences. All right? It's funny, because a lot of times I'll have people in class say, well, design, you know, that's just about personal preference. What one person likes another person won't like. That's true to a degree, all right, but not completely, all right. In other words, we can make some, you can make some, you, you can make better arguments than that, than to say I simply like that, or I simply don't like that. You can make better arguments based on what you would expect your user's goals are, and what is going to, what kind of design elements are going to benefit them. All right. Okay. So that is one aspect of the box. All right. Now, if we're talking about how much real estate something takes up, the total real estate, the total space on the screen that something takes up, is actually the sum of the margin, the border, 
the padding, and the width. That's how much it takes horizontally. In other words, if I have a 10 pixel margin, a 1 pixel border, a 5 pixel padding, and a width of 200, assuming I have the same thing on the other side, The total space this takes up is 10 plus 1 plus 5, that's 16, plus 200, plus another 16, or 232. Another way to put it is the margin, the, the, the margin, the border, and the padding don't come out of the width. All right? When you specify a width of 200, you're not specifying the total width. You're specifying the width of the content area. All right? And the margin, the padding, the border are, is tacked on to that total width. Yeah, go ahead. No, it, 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 it totally makes sense. And this actually becomes really important when we talk about mobile stuff. All right. Um, different devices may have different size dots. In other words, if you were to take a ruler and measure a 5 pixel border or a 100 pixel border to make it bigger, you know, if you took a ruler, would it be the same on an iPhone as it would be on a monitor as it would be on my phone? And the answer is no. The individual pixels might be smaller. In addition, the density of the pixels, in other words, how close together the pixels are, might matter as well. All right? I, I hesitate to use relative in that context. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. How it actually looks. Yeah. All right, here, 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 let's show exactly what he means. Here's this border, and, and the border is how many pixels? The border is five pixels. Let's make it 25 pixels for good measure. All right, that's how big it is. If I go and change the screen resolution of this, and I hope this works on the display. If I go and change the screen resolution of this to be 800 by 600 pixels, all right, could you see the difference? It's still five pixels, right. If I go in and make the display like that, uh, doesn't like that. Let's make it just a little. Well, kind of like that. It's kind of hard to, to see on this, but he's absolutely right. Five pixels is five pixels are five pixels. You just want me to do that so I break the monitor and have to have to quit. Yeah, like so. Right, right. Huh? 
How did we do it before? I hit a button and it came right back. Ow. Yeah, I know how you right click on something. <laughs> I, I, there's no desktop. There's no desktop for me to see. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Just so you don't think I'm an idiot, that's what I'm seeing. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the point is, it's five pixels, it's five pixels. It's five dots across the screen. That's it, absolutely. How that's going to look on the, uh, on Times Square, on the video monitors there, five pixels going to be this big. On my phone, five pixels going to be that big. Still five pixels. And that is called absolute. All right, because it absolutely is five pixels. As opposed to a percentage, where I say five percent, all right, if it is, um, a thousand pixels wide, it'll be, what, 50 pixels, 5% of that. If I have a smaller screen that was 400, it would be 20 pixels. So, yeah, that's what we mean. All right. The point is, is in calculating the width, all those things add up. There was a question, or, or it came up in discussion quirks mode the other day. One of the primary bugs that defines quirks mode is that earlier versions of IE got this wrong. Earlier versions of IE took the border, margin, and padding out of the width. So earlier versions of IE, this is just sort of a history lesson, all right? Earlier versions of IE, if I specified a width of 400 pixels, let's say, and gave a padding of 10, a border of 10, and a margin of 10, it would actually decrease the amount available of content to 340 pixels. In other words, they incorrectly implemented that feature in CSS and the width was the width of everything. And you took the border and the margin out of it. That's not correct and that's been corrected in, in uh, browsers. But again, there are still potentially some web pages out there from ages ago that have that bug built into them because that's how browsers work then. That's why we need the quirks mode. All right. Now, the next thing that we can do is we can start playing with the position of the items. All right. And again, there's sort of two ways that we can accomplish position, you know. We, we continually see this. There's, there's a fixed way and there's a more fluid, relative, floating sort of way. The easiest one, the easier of the two to understand is with fixed positioning. All right? And with fixed positioning, I can specify a top and a left position. I can also specify a right or a bottom, but typically... We, we think of the position in terms of the, the location relative to this sort of origin, the top corner. So I can go into CSS and I'm going to go in and I'm going to give each of my articles distinct IDs. Remember, an ID needs to be unique. So I'll give them each IDs. Now here's a very beneficial thing about CSS. I want all these characteristics for an article. I want to treat Article 1 a little different than Article 2. 
So I don't have to I don't have to go and re-specify all those attributes for article one and article two. By virtue of the fact that these are articles, it's going to get those rules. But I can go in and say now article one, the thing that has an ID of article one, I want to be 100 pixels from the top, 5 pixels from the left. And oh yeah, this is an absolute position as opposed to other kinds of positions that we haven't talked about yet. And Article 2, I can say I want it also to be 100 pixels to the left, but I want it to, or from the top, but I want it to be uh, maybe 10. Uh, let's go in and let's make these a little smaller. So that's 10, 25, that's 35, 65, 70, 470. Now let's make this about 500 pixels from the left. I think that will put these guys side by side. And there we go. Now notice a couple things it was very brutal with. All right, It covered up some of my content on the top. right? It also sort of makes unnecessary the margin because I'm saying glue this thing down in that position. So I could go in and adjust that a little bit, make the top of these guys, 200 is probably overkill, 150, and we'll make the left of this guy 600. Keep in mind that you can give it conflicting instructions to CSS. All right. For example, in this case, I said that I wanted the margins to be such and such, but I also wanted the left position to be 500. Well, it can't do both of those, so it, it did one of them. All right, so there. That looks like a decent page, and we could play with it to maybe refine it and and make it look a little better if we wanted to. But what we've done is we've positioned those boxes. All right. This is like when I was in high school and we did the school paper. When we did the school paper, we had a big sheet of paper and someone would type out and manually justify them. Manual justifying is the worst thing I've done in my life. Seriously. If you came in the room right now and said, I could either be tortured or I could manually justify an article, I would say, just, just torture me. All right? I, I'm sure it would be much more pleasant. You had to actually count the characters and then figure out if it was, say, 28 characters across. Well, this sentence has 23 characters in, so I'm going to stick an extra character after the word the and stick an extra character after computer and stick two extra uh, characters after monitor and figure out that way. At any rate, we would have these big sheets of paper and we would cut out and glue down in a certain position on that paper, this is where this article is going to be. That's exactly what we're doing here. That's where this article is going to be. And we specify it based on from the top and from the left. Again, you could do bottom and right, but typically the way our society reads things, we go, you know, top to bottom, left to right, so it makes sense to position them that way. Now this is just one way of doing position. It's the most straightforward way. Alright? Position absolute where we glue everything down. Alright? This has its merits. It has its merits in so far as we can get a very precise layout and be pretty sure it's going to look pretty close on a variety of platforms. As we know in real life, there's always catches with each of those things, you know, and, and like, well, yeah, except for blah, blah, blah. The problem is, is that depending on your screen size and screen resolution, this could either look great or it could look horrible, all right? If I were to view this on a phone, for example, 
I might only see this much of the screen. In fact, we can, we can go and we can do that. We can run the mobile emulator here. I know I'm going over, but it's spring break next week, and I'm going to miss you guys, so I want this class to last as long as I can. <laughs> mobile emulator, this page is going to look like this on this kind of device. And that's not really good. Now, the reverse is true, too. If I have a gigantic monitor, that code is going to look like a little postage stamp up there. All right? So there's better ways, and there's more mobile-friendly ways of doing things than this fixed. But fix is a good place to start, as far as positioning goes. Question? Hmm? I, I'm not sure. Right. Yep. You, correctly. Correct. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Right. Exactly. And when we get into floating and relative positioning, it, it, it's a little, little less clear, a little less straightforward. I don't think I would do anything to make it do during spring break. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it, I would not require anything to be turned in. So I don't know what it says. All right. Let's, let's head to lab. Um,